It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and thanks for coming to hear my talk. Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh -oh. I'm going to mess it up. Hold on. What am I doing wrong? Staying away. I don't know how tall you are. That tall? Yeah. Sure. Better. Okay. Thank you very much. Is that good? You can hear me now? All right. So is my presentation supposed to come up? Oh, okay. Perfect. So tonight I'm, a, I'm here to talk to you about a project um, that we're doing at the Valdez Terminal, um, looking at basically hydrocarbon de degradation products. Um, and so typically we know measures of hydrocarbons in water. We measure, you know, uh, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, right? It's called BTEX. Or some other terms we might know are, you know, total uh, petroleum hydrocarbons in the form of like diesel range organics or gasoline range organics. So those things um, are outside my area of expertise. Where I study is these complex mixtures that can't be measured in forms of BTEX or TPHD or things of that nature. So I'm going to go and I'm going to tell you a little overview of what we're doing at the Valdez Terminal. Um, we haven't finished collecting our data yet, but we have another project in Cook Inlet that's very similar. And so I'm going to show you what we're doing in Cook Inlet, and it's the same kind of logic that applies to what we're doing in Valdez. So what we're thinking about is unsegregated ballast water. And so what this is, is it's exactly the way it sounds is, you know, ships need uh, to collect water and put it in their ballast to, uh, you know, um, make their ship uh, uh, stable, I guess, in uh, rough weather. And so what they do is they add water to the same holds where they hold their oil, right? So now you have this oil and water that's getting mixed up. And so we'll see these things, these dissolved hydrocarbons that'll go and partition into the aqueous phase. And so then they unload these, uh, their ballast water, these treatment facilities, uh, where it's treated and released back into the environment. So when we think of components of petroleum just in general, right, we think about these large range of compounds, right? We have, you know, aliphatic compounds, aromatic compounds. They can get really complicated like asphaltines. We can think about also as like a continuum of compounds in the ranges of size where you go from methane to these really large gigantic uh, asphaltine, what they're called asphaltine um, products. And so uh, there's also species that have metals in them um, that are derived from like chlorophyll. And so, you know, when you think about these compounds, right, these are things that we can measure individually um, with uh, techniques like gas chromatography or liquid chromatography. But the problem is, is this is not what crude oil is made of, right? Crude oil is only a small fraction of what it's made of. It's made of like hundreds of thousands of different compounds. Oops, sorry. Um, where you can start thinking of putting these aliphatic chains on all these aromatic rings, right? And different numbers, um, uh, different you know, arrangements and things like that, right? And those compounds get so large that we can't measure them traditionally by gas chromatography, specifically when they get oxidized and they become polar. And these are the ones that are gonna want to partition into the aqueous phase. So the Valdez uh, ballast water treatment facility, um, there's, you know, it goes through a gravity se separation where it's offloaded, right? The oil um, floats to the top, you skim off the oil and you send the rest of the water to um, a DAF, right? And here, basically, you can think of it just as like bubbling air through it to get rid of the volatiles. So, you know, these are things uh, kind of like BTEX, uh, that, you know, these volatile compounds uh, that we want to eliminate. And then the final step and the most interesting step for us is this biological treatment step. And so in this biological treatment step, it's supposed to take, you know, these remainder of these hydrocarbons and degrade them, right? And it degrades them into uh, compounds uh, that uh, we, they're no longer BTEX or total petroleum hydrocarbons. They're other compounds. Um, they're oxygenated analogs of them. And while some of those, uh, some of the um, hydrocarbons are, you know, degraded and released as gas, um, from the microbes, others are just transformed into these leftover products. And so when you look at these, this is a gas chromatograph. Um, so on the bottom, we have time. So this is the time that our, um, these analytes spend on these uh, GC columns um, versus just abundance in this direction. And so we can see these different analytes. These are just the BTEX, right? So these are just a small 
number of compounds uh, that we measure in petroleum. And then you can look down on this gas chromatograph, right? And we can see things like uh, gasoline range organics uh, and diesel range organics. And they're just, these are based on their carbon numbers. So the number of carbon uh, atoms that they have in them. And so when you look at uh, historical data, uh, this is Jim Payne's data um, at the uh, ballast water treatment facility. And we're thinking about BTEX, right? In all cases, we see that BTEX goes away, right? It does its job, it gets rid of BTEX. We can no longer measure BTEX and use that as a metric. But what does happen is that we wind up forming or increasing what we call this unresolved complex mixture. And so those were the compounds I was telling you about that are no longer identifiable by individually by like these gas chromatography techniques. So we can no longer separate these out into individual column, um, uh, individual um, compounds and then identify them. And so what we're left is, you know, we have here's where we'll have our things that we can identify. And then as they're degraded, they leave what's called the UCM or the unresolved complex mixture. And that's what we're interested in. Um, so if these compounds are relatively large, they're polydispersed and they're going to be polar. So that means uh, they're going to have like oxygen heteroatoms in them. Again, this is why they would partition into the aqueous phase. Um, and we can't measure, it's really difficult to measure their chemical composition and structure individually, right? Because it's like a soup of hundreds and thousands of compounds. So again, the UCM is our, our major area of interest and to kind of uh, determine what's in this soup, if you will. So I'm going to shift gears. So that's what we're doing at the Valley's Terminal. We're still collecting all of our samples. Um, but this project is um, what we're doing actually currently in Cook Inlet, and we have some data. So I just wanted to show you uh, what we're doing to give you an idea of uh, how we'll be proceeding with the, uh, uh, the Valley's Terminal project. So this is a project about photochemical formation um, and bioaccumulation of these high hydrocarbon oxidation products. And, um, you know, we're looking obviously at high latitudes. And so this, Pat, um, this project's run by uh, Pat Tomko, and then we co-advised uh, our graduate student, uh, Max Harsha, who's funded by an Osprey Fellowship. So high latitude spills, there's a lot of them, right? And the whole idea is that they're going to increase as you know, leases, more leases are provided. Um, and also as you know, shipping channels open uh, in the Arctic because of what we hear earlier, because of ice, loss of ice. So, you know, there's a lot, there's, um, you know, a lot of opportunities for spills in these high latitude environments. We've obviously studied this a lot in lower latitudes. The deep water horizon spill is a prime example, but the conditions up here are way different than they are down there, obviously, right? We're talking about temperature changes. We're talking about sunlight changes, whether it happens, you know, in the midsummer or whether it happens in the winter or somewhere in between. And we also have challenges like ice. So we're interested in the work at Cook Inlet because it's a, you know, it's a, um, a critical estuary in South Central Alaska, you know, it has diverse ecosystem, strong tidal currents, um, it's near major population centers, um, it's an oil producing basin, um, and there's uh, uh, the two most historically spilled oils which we focus on here are the uh, Cook Inlet crude oil and also diesel fuel. So we looked at, we examined both looking at their chemical composition and also this relationships they have to uh, their toxicity of these products. So when we're talking about hydrocarbon oxidation products, again, we're, we're talking about formation of these products from um, uh, spilled oil. So again, these are products that become oxygenated. Once they become oxygenated, right, they can partition from the oil phase into the aqueous phase, and then they're water soluble. Um, and here they're going to be driven more interested in is the photochemical, basically uh, how the oxidation that's caused by photochemical processes. And so, again, we produce these uh, water soluble bioavailable um, compounds and that they can they can move you know, both vertically and uh, 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 laterally through water columns and they can move far away from their um, their originating source once they're dissolved in the aqueous phase. And so commonly, we again, we, we focus on, you know, BTEX, total petroleum hydrocarbons, um, but we don't really focus on these water-soluble oxygenated products. So we're also, we're, the tests we're doing for our bioaccumulation studies are on bay mussels, 
Um, so they're ubiquitous and they stay in one place. Um, they accumulate you know, pollutants because they filter feed um, and they're of uh, commercial interest because uh, we eat them. So the object objectives of the study are the first one is we wanted to simulate a uh, spill. So we just do this in a microcosm um, in the laboratory so we can control as many variables as possible. We wanted to, we use these techniques to identify uh, the formation of these hydrocarbon oxidation products in those laboratory simulations. And then we wanted to look at the bioaccumulation um, in these muscles. So, our, like I said, we we're setting up these microcosm experiments. This is all in the lab bench scale. So here we're just looking, we have these jacketed beakers, right? So we can control the temperature and make it equivalent to what we expect in Alaska. Um, we, you know, cover them with quartz, uh, quartz lids, try to uh, mitigate uh, evaporation, but also let the solar spectrum through. Um, we have a prescribed amount of oil to, you know, uh, 50 milliliters of water. And uh, we do these incubations um, in different increments um, in triplicate with dark controls. And so we also mimic the, uh, the solar spectrum that we would expect to see in Alaska, uh, obviously, versus uh, previous studies we've done in the Gulf of Mexico. So we, did, we simulated the, the oil spills. The next is to identify uh, these hops. And so we see, we can look at uh, this formation of these hydrocarbon oxidation products and we can quali quantify them, excuse me, as dissolved organic carbon. So basically what you can see is if we look at the, the samples that were exposed to light versus the ones that were exposed in the dark, we see this rapid increase in dissolved organic carbon, right? So what that's telling us is that we're forming these oxygenated products that can then partition into the aqueous phase versus our dark, which, um, which you know, they, it, there are compounds that are going to be water soluble, but they're not as abundant as they are in these light exposed samples. So we see that this happens for both diesel and uh, crude oil to different extents. So now we want to try to characterize these products, like what are they? How can we determine what they look like? So we use a, a couple of different techniques. We use um, uh, uh, optical spectroscopy. So this is fluorescent spectroscopy. Um, so here we can look at their fluorescent signatures, right? If we think about um, crude components of crude oil, right? They're going to be aromatic so they can absorb light and then they'll fluoresce. So it's an easy way to measure them. We don't have to do any kind of extractions. Um, for a sample so we can actually measure the raw water that's just filtered so we don't we're not doing anything selective there um, and then we can statistically analyze them um, to look at different regions of uh, fluorophores uh, and correlate them with um, different types of uh, uh, chemical compounds and their reactivity. The other thing we use is ultra high resolution mass spectrometry. This is the orbit trap um, that's orbit trap mass spectrometer that's located at UAA and Pat Tomko's lab. And so what we can do with this is um, we can introduce our samples and it can, we can identify individual molecular formulas. So we can't we can infer structure from these formulas, but uh, we can't identify them individually as compounds. And so, but one of the, the disadvantages of this technique is that we have to extract them. So we have some selectivity there. Um, and then we're looking at, again, these oxygen uh, compounds. So we deprotonate them and that's what negative ion electrospray um, means. So this is what we get when we, um, uh, when we do the statistical analyses of the fluorescence data. So we get these different components um, and the big thing here is when we look at their uh, excitation and emission maxima. So from previous work, we could really determine that uh, these lower wavelengths are the ones that are most likely to you know, cause a toxic toxicological response from what we've seen so far. So we're really interested in looking at those fluorophores. Um, and like this gives us targets in the future too, to try to chromatographically isolate these, these chemistries um, for different types of toxicological studies. So these compounds are petroleum derived from our crude oil. 
Um, these are more like these low wavelength, they call them in the literature, uh, the dissolved organic matter literature, they call them protein like, but that's really a misnomer. We know that there's no proteins in crude oil. Um, these are likely just uh, relatively aliphatic compounds. So it'd be aromatic rings with long aliphatic chains on them. And then these, they call this humic-like. And so these are these really uh, high excitation and emission wavelengths. So these are what you would generally see in like, uh, if you looked at organic matter collected from like soil or and things like that. So these are gonna be really large structures with a lot of oxygen functionalities on them. So what we did was we, uh, we can track these changes in, these, uh, in the chemical composition. So if you look over at this plot, this is a, um, uh, principal component analysis. Um, and what we can see is we can look at the crude oil and the diesel. So the, the colors are light and we can see, uh, or the colors are shaded, excuse me. And so what we can see with our crude oil um, and our diesel is that we're having like two different, there's two different compositional trends, right? So over here with the crude oil, we see, uh, you know, C1, 2, and 5 are our most common components. So they're these relatively, um, redshifted components, so our longer wavelength, excuse me. Um, and then we can see with the, uh, the diesel, those products that we're forming are more closely related to C4, 3, and 6. And so these are our lower wavelength ones, the ones that we've previously identified that may have some toxicological response. And we can look at the relative contribution of these uh, uh, certain ones of these, uh, these uh, components, excuse me, um, by looking at, you know, sh relatively short uh, wavelengths um, versus relatively long wavelengths. And we can see over a function of time with those are exposures um, that, you know, some increase and others decrease. And so I told you we can uh, generate molecular formula from that uh, ultra high resolution mass spectrometry technique. So then we had to reduce all that data. And one of the way we reduce it is uh, these things called Van Crevelin diagrams. And all they are are plots of oxygen to carbon ratio uh, versus hydrogen to carbon ratio. So you can basically think of up and down here is the degree of saturation. So the further the lower you get, you're gonna be more aromatic. The higher you get, you're gonna be more saturated like an aliphatic compound. And then as you move from left to right, it'll be just basically oxygen content. So we're increasing an oxy uh, oxygen content. And so one way we can look at these is we can look at the samples that are exposed um, uh, in the light. And we can look at the compounds that we form collected during the dark and we can subtract them. And we can do a subtraction plot and see that these compounds are left, right? This is the light minus the dark. And so what we see are these relatively uh, low, um, the relatively low O to C um, and highly saturated type compounds um, that are in the water. So now we're thinking, you know, these compounds are going to be relatively aliphatic and they're going to have oxygen containing functionality. So there's no way we're going to see these by a traditional, you know, total petroleum hydrocarbon analysis. Um, but we can we can measure them here. So this is just the crude, uh, the Cook Inlet crude and the diesel crude. And it basically is just showing that we form similar similar types of product. Um, independent of whether we're looking at a whole, whole crude oil or a diesel. So that we can then take and we can classify these compounds. Again, this is just another data reduction te technique. So we can classify them into aliphatic, these unsaturated low oxygen, unsaturated high oxygen, and aromatic compounds. <clears throat> and so what we see with uh, the uh, whole oil or the cook inlet crude is that we're mostly forming like these aromatic and condensed aromatic type compounds, where when we had the diesel relative to the um, re relative to the whole crude, that we're now looking at more like unsaturated low oxygen uh, type compounds. And so there we, you know, we've identified these compounds that are being produced from this diesel um, and crude oil, uh, cooking the crude oil, right? We're producing these, uh, they're oxygenated, um, but they're relatively uh, low oxygen containing um, aliphatic uh, compounds. And so we're actually working right now to um, get this uh, paper published on those, on those data. So finally, we wanna look at um, bioaccumulation uh, and of these hops and mussels. So we just have some preliminary data here. Um, 
But basically, this is just the experimental design. Uh, these are all you know uh, collected here in Alaska. Um, uh, all the work was done um, in Alaska. Uh, and so we uh, monitored you know pH dissolved oxygen um, in these chambers that we created um, and put our muscles in there. So this is just a schematic of um, of our experiment. Uh, showing you know that we put these muscles in artificial seawater with uh, these hops that we've generated from our uh, irradiation experiments um, produced from this uh, the cook inlet crude oil and diesel and then we collected samples after 24 48 and 96 uh, 96 hours um, each of these containers that we have held uh, 30 muscles and they weren't exposed to light during this incubation and we maintain the water 12 C and so this is just another visualization of our setup. You know, we have these buckets. They each have, you know, these uh, the 30 muscles in them each. And so really the, the what we've seen uh, uh, so far in kind of these first round of tests is that there is a relatively high mortality, or there is mortality, we'll say, with the photosolubilized diesel. So the hops produced from diesel um, uh, produces mortality. And we do not see that with those compounds produced from the crude oil. And so this is of interest to us is because we try to, when we think of crude oil, I mentioned at the beginning, there's like this continuum of compounds from very small to very large. So by doing analysis with, you know, these refined fractions, we start cutting down um, the carbon number range that we're analyzing in these complex mixtures. So, you know, even though a crude oil would have uh, diesel, you know, diesel in it, right? Enriching that diesel uh, demonstrates that that's where we're causing the mortality of what we see so far. And so we collected muscle tissue, and we're going to do um, analyses on those to look at the uptake of these hydrocarbon oxidation products. Um, yeah, that's what I mentioned. This is just the experimental design we're going to do. We're going to look at targeted pHs and uh, oxy pHs uh, using these targeted analysis. So those are compounds we can identify um, uh, by um, uh, LC coupled with uh, mass spectrometry. And so just to conclude here, um, you know, so we use this, these, these uh, techniques to analyze these complex mixtures of hydrocarbon oxidation products um, uh, uh, produced from uh, cook inlet crude and diesel. Um, we see the bioaccumulation of hops that the bay mussels uh, had 45% uh, mortality to the, the hops generated from uh, diesel. And we're extracting uh, in MS analyses on the tissue uh, from those muscles moving forward. With that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Well, thank you for all that information. And maybe you covered this. Um, huh? Most of the people in this room, I think, aren't scientists. And I guess if you could, my limited understanding, you know, why do we care? Why are, you know, oxygenated hydrocarbons? My understanding is that it's more toxic than just, you know, hydrocarbons alone. But if you could simplify that down, why should we care about oxygenated hydro hydrocarbons? And um, why is this important, I guess? So in the terms of the, the Valdez terminal, right? So they are... They're basically taking in these these uh, crude oils, if you will, or these uh, water, and they're oxidizing them, and then they're just releasing those oxidation products. That's what's up on the effluent. So we're interested in what's being released, you know, out into Prince William Sound and Port Uh So that specifically is of interest there, and um, just because there's no really good techniques to characterize those oxygenated. Uh, products. So we don't know there's a wide spectrum of products and we don't know where in those spectrum, you know, what's toxic and what's not. And that's what we're trying to find out. So we can come up with some type of assay where we can make a quantitative measurement of those you know, moving forward. Thanks a lot. So the difference between uh, crude oil and diesel, I find that interesting, but Possibly is it because diesel oil has been refined and subject to heat and the such? Well, I, I would imagine it has more to do with like the carbon number of diesel because those are smaller compounds. 
So those compounds are going to be more likely to be bioavailable and um, accumulate that way. So yeah, that's, yeah. So in a way, yes, it's because they've been heated and extracted from the crude oil. Got it. Yep. Into a concentrated fraction. Oh, sorry. Good presentation. Uh, curious, curious with your, uh, your, 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 your test waters, you know, you had your, your little, your vials there with the different mixtures. You did have a control with no hydrocarbon inputs. Right. What are the hops like in that? Are, are there naturally yeah. occurring? So yeah, there are, there are natural occurring hops, but not in this experiment. In this experiment, we were using artificial seawater. So we knew the seawater that we were using for our controls was clean. Okay. Yeah. So there was no background carbon. Um, that's why it's even difficult to do these experiments with regular seawater yeah, yeah. is because there's a background organic carbon signature. And so we're trying to eliminate that by using artificial seawater. Okay. Yep. Great. I was just going to simplify um, the answer even further. Please do. Um, for Donna, you know, one of the things that we've always done when we're analyzing for whether there's impacts or ling lingering hydrocarbons in the environment is we focus on alphatics and pHs. They're all um, basically nonpolar compounds. And, and so if you analyze and you look and you watch for the disappearance of that and you st start merging with background can, um, levels, we, we assume that it's clean. Right. But really... What happened was because of the methods, they're not detecting these polar compounds. So there's a whole class of compounds out there that we have never been measuring for when we start talking about monitoring for right. impacts of, and so, I mean, to me, that's the, the real meat of why this is really important is to understand what, you know, what we've been missing and, and then being able to take the next step and look at, but I also um, wanted to bring up something about the, the diesel versus crude because with crude you know they've always sort of benchmarked it with like benzoapyrene some of the five and six ring compounds as being the real toxic components and with with these experiments you're talking about like pricings and lighter and so I think that's really interesting and can you see weathering patterns I mean I know the oxygenation by itself is weathering but can you um can you look at the distribution and see how long so it's been in the environment oh from uh, like a natural sample yeah mm -hmm. just similar to what you do with like pages. no we're working on some methods now that are they're compound specific methods so it's where we can identify kind of these aromatic products and then do what's called um isotope ratio mass spectrometry which is um basically it helps us fingerprint source so we can track it back to source. Um, so we're working on that, um, but it's really hard to go out in the environment and look at these products and kind of determine how long they've been there. Because as soon as they're photo uh, solubilized, um, you know, then uh, biodegradation is gonna take over too. So they're gonna have all these uh, processes, you know, going at it all at once. Um, yeah, so. Oh, question on one. Yeah, thanks for a really great talk. Um, I was wondering if there's any specific uh, like toxicological biomarkers or effects that come from oxygenated products. So I know we haven't been measuring them in the environment, but would we see them in organism responses? I'm, I'm going to call for a lifeline from Pat yeah. Tomka. Oh, you give me too much uh, credit for that one. <laughs> I get a lifeline. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, so we've done a bunch of studies with these uh, oxidation products with uh, with mussels in these in these controls, mostly with the uh, crude oil and burn crude oil, but it's mostly like heat shock protein assay. It's with uh, Katrina Cunahan, who talked uh, a couple of years ago here at the um, at the uh, at this at this event, and so we we since have been taking these oxidized fractions and exposing the mussels with these oxidized fractions, and we've seen a lot of these similar biomarker endpoints that you see with the traditional um, PAHs and these alkylated PAHs in these oxidized products. So all the way from uh, DNA damage to you know micronuclei, 
formation, hydrogen peroxide formation, heat shock protein, cytochrome P450. Yeah, the whole suite that you traditionally see in these tox assays. Um, we're, we see the response more correlated with the disappearance of the PAHs and the appearance of the oxidized products. So that's about as much as I can confirm. <laughs> Then do you want to do that online question, Danielle? Thanks, Pat. Okay. <laughs> this question is from Zuzana Kolakova. Have you considered two-dimensional GC for characterization? I know it has been useful characterizing fuel mixtures, for example, to assess fuel quality. Yes. Yeah, so we're actually working with some people now that are experts in GCGC, but even um, this two-dimensional gas chromatography, like it allows you to look at um, more polar products um, simply. Uh, but still, there's when you get to the end of that, even though you can see a relative number of these polar products, um, we're still you still get an unresolved complex mixture at the end of it, and that's that's really what we're focusing on is that unresolved complex mixture. Thanks.